Regardless of what sport you're in, Hollow Braid Dyneema is a pretty powerful tool. You can splice it inside of itself and make all sorts of different contraptions. A very simple thing that you can do is put a fixed eye on either end where this is spliced into itself, and you can have a fixed length of rope here with an eye on either end, no knots. And how you can connect that at this point is you can take a soft shackle, which is like a soft carabiner, and you could put this through here, for example, put it over the head, and that is one way to connect this. The question in this video is whether or not you can splice and dice this thing in a very creative way in order to integrate the soft shackle into the length of material that you're using. Let me show you with this large sample what the intricacies of this is, and then we'll be breaking uh, some control samples, and we'll be breaking type 1 and type 2 that we show you. Now, Dyneema can be found all over a sailboat, but it also really changed the game for us in highlining. It's used in cave anchors in order to do ultralight cave expeditions. Even in climbing, Dyneema is even used in some cams in order to make these ultralight. And we've got a very popular video about that and all the little details that go into splicing this down here. I've also used soft shackles to add a belay loop to my harness since this thing's like 60 kilonewton strong, three times stronger than the belay loop your harness comes with. But that's a nerdy thing. Don't do it unless you completely understand the benefits of that. In a week from filming this, I'll be doing another zip line in Moab where we use a kilometer of this stuff in order to zip line base jump off of. So there's so many different use cases for this. It's also very popular in the off-roading community because for the same reasons that I use it here in my Slack Snap Lab, all the hydraulics are underneath this table here and it goes around two arborist pulleys and back over here. And the reasons I like to have Dyneema and soft shackles in my brake test setup is when things go flying. The same reason that off-roaders like using Dyneema. If things go flying, soft stuff is moving, not steel cable. Now you lose a lot of strength in ropes when you tie knots. Not that it's a huge problem, especially safety ratios there for almost everything you're doing. But it's nice that you can take something so tiny because you're not gonna be reducing the strength of this significantly if you splice an eye in it. Now we have an entire playlist on the nerdy videos about Dyneema because I like it so much. And I'm going to, if you're watching this six months or a year after I've made this video, then there will very likely be a place in our website where it's not just a playlist, but a summary of every video as you can scroll through. So in about a half an hour, you can learn everything I've spent the last five years learning about this stuff. When that happens, I'll be sure to put that in the description below. Let me show you these two different styles of what we're gonna be testing today. Now, Johan made all of these, and this is made specifically to be a sample to where you have a different color here, so you can see that it's this color coming through here. Normally, you taper your tails. You can see that the part that is spliced through here is the part that's coming through here, and this is a brummel that's going to a button knot, not a diamond knot, because that way the tails go back down, creating a bigger noose here for the soft shackle to not have such a narrow bend radius. If this had a very large bend radius, even like, that big, this would actually probably get more strength out of a normal soft shackle. But we got a couple things going on here. The red strand that this is now integrated into there, then the red is actually pinched in here. That's why you can get away with such a short berry right here. And it's spliced back into itself. Now, if we evaluate how this is being loaded, this side is obviously the noose going around the button head. But this side is pulling on the gray strand and the red strand that is brummeled through. So my theory is this might break here because this is gonna be significantly stronger than a single strand. Now the question is, is it gonna break where the taper is because our samples have proper tapers? Or is it going to break where all this brummel action is happening? As opposed to the type two that is going on here, you can see it's a lot simpler to see what's going on as you basically just have a loop here creating the same button knot and this is now pulling against the top noose here on one side, but also it's pulling against the Brummel on this side. And so I don't think that's gonna be really good for it, but you can get away with that a little bit because you got a Brummel Brummel and you have to have quite a bit splice in order for a Brummel to work. A Brummel doesn't work all by itself as we've tested things like that. It's working in conjunction with the finger trap technology this has. To our eye, this looks round, but it's actually very polygon in shape. And so when you have one on the other, it creates like this key lock, but you have to have enough of it because it's such a slippery material in order for it to hold. 
Now you can see that our samples are significantly more narrow than this visual sample. And you still have the same thing going on. This is the type one that is all integrated crisscross applesauce down here. And you can see a tiny type two sample here where it's integrated into the top right here. And this is its own thing with the Brummel eye for it to be inside of. Now this is four millimeter D pro from Leros. And ropes kind of have a rubber ruler going on. We have a whole video on how diameters get changed, but the SK78, which is the quality of Dyneman that this is, or HMPE, high molecular weight polyethylene, the four millimeter diameter can change after the post-treatment that it is going under. And this can be anywhere from three and a half. Three and a half seems to be where I can freely spin it inside. And then at four millimeters, you can pretty much see a gap right there. Now, how I'm going to test this is pull to failure, but I'm doing it at a rate of 30 millimeters per second. I believe some test beds are 10 millimeters per second. And so if you're pulling three times slower than me, you can get higher results, which may or may not be any more helpful than what I'm doing. So if we don't get, and I'm just disclaiming it now, if we don't get the manufacturer's um, bullshit strength, BMBS, um, minimum braking strength, then it's because I'm not pulling it exactly the way they pulled it. They didn't make the numbers up. They're just testing it different than I am. One of the last videos that I think I made on Dyneema, it, uh, I was like cyclically loading it because you can actually make it stronger, I've heard, if you do that. And the results were all over the place. Uh, we're doing three samples of each with three control samples. And you would have to do a hundred samples of each before you can take anything to the grave. But this is a good starting point to even understand where it's gonna break. And then if we're like way off from the quoted strengths you're getting, or because this should be retaining 90, even a hundred percent. But uh, spoiler, it doesn't. Let's just find out how bad this is. So there is the Brummel eye. And down here at the end of the taper, is where it broke. And again, it broke in that tapered zone. Okay, so this time it broke on this side's taper, but still at the taper. So each sample is buried at 50 times its diameter. It's tapered 15 times its diameter, and there's 25 centimeters unspliced in between. And you can see that we got some pretty varied results here. And that's something I just see all the time in Dyneema. So now I'm going to test type one and let's play a fun game. Let's guess where it's going to break in this because we know the taper down here is weak, but has this weakened it at all? So before you see the pull, pause the video and tell me where you think you're going to see this type one break. Maybe the type two, maybe the same place. And um, let's make the comments a very helpful section for anybody learning this stuff and put your thoughts and theories of why things are doing different things. My guess is going to be up here in the Brummel. I'm 50-50 I'm on whether or not it's gonna be in the taper. Oh! So this just got pulled out, but look how like round and smooth that just made that as it slid out, but it didn't break in the taper. So this Brummel looks pretty angry here. So this is the side that didn't get destroyed and there's this mess. <laughs> that is the side that did not fail. And you can see that the stress is happening right there. And then the side that did fail looks like the tearing is there. Went through. Definitely looking for your guys' thoughts in the comments on this one. Looks like that side started to have some failure before before this had full failure. I wonder once it breaks, it's pulling this out because it's not brummeled anymore. That is a really good taper. So this is the crazy thing about it. Anyways, this is almost 50% of that. And then and then there's this. So I don't know, it's in the ballpark. Have some safety ratio. If you need to upsize the diameter, do that. Now we're gonna pull on type two. And I think that 
added piece is gonna pull through that Brummel. So in the description, I'm gonna have a link to our blog, which is gonna have the entire write-up that Johan made, explaining what he did, how he did it, what his thoughts are, and where he found the videos, and videos that link off to like how to Brummel, how to do all this stuff. Uh, the Rigloft Matthew Odo is uh, one of the videos that he was inspired by, and it's just gonna be a ton of links I can't just say in a video, but it's very helpful, and it's gonna be in the blog. And everything, of course, is timestamped below if you wanna jump back and see anything specific. Let's break type two. <laughs> oh, 10 is good. Oh shit, that did just a lot better than I thought it would. Oh, look at that cute little eye. There you go. Maybe you can reverse engineer what broke. <laughs> Something to do with the Brummel here. So it didn't pull all the way through on that one, but this loop pulled through something on this side. Now this strand is 50% loaded with this strand, so they're fighting each other in a way that makes it stronger than I thought it was going to be. Instant slow-mo replay. So it broke right there. So we'll make this nicer and have it on the blog, but that was pretty consistent here, getting all tens on type two, though you can have an outlier here if we just did more samples, just like we can have more of an outlier up here if we did more of these as well. I hope you guys found this useful. Kilonewtons is a very common measurement of force in climbing. All of the pounds of force and kilograms of force, if you prefer those, will be on the blog with Johan's email as well if you want to nerd out with him on something or put something in the comments below on what you want us to chase next. You can also grab a soft shackle shirt at hownottoswag.com. If you've made it this far into a video, you might be into something like that. Anyways, thanks for watching. Please click this because videos like this don't get nearly as many views as other types of videos I make. Um, so that way I know to keep making them. Cheers. Bonus test. Let's pull on this guy. Ooh, 9.72. Pretty impressive.